Glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offenders who truly obey, that moment may enter the heavenly way. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Great things He hath taught us, great things He hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before His throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. 
Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a future. God has a plan for me. Of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word, I put my hope in your holy word, your word is faithful mighty in power God will deliver me of this I'm sure of this I'm sure Jesus you're my firm foundation I know I can stand secure Jesus you're my firm foundation I put my hope in your holy word I put my hope in your holy word. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence now. I thank you, our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. You are of God of everlasting, a God that led Abraham, led Isaac, and Jacob, the God that we read about in the Old Testament, whose kingdom was, you are a God who is, and you are a God who is coming. You have created the depths of the sea, you have created the mountaintops, and neither of those extremes define or encompass the love that you have for us. You breathed your own breath of life into each and every one of us, you have bestowed your spirit upon us, your one and only son you did not keep from us. Yet the same blood that flows in us is the blood that was in him, and we are co-heirs in the promises and the riches of salvation that are true in you. Father God, let our voices proclaim praise and worship and glory and honor to you as we gather this morning to do just that. I pray over each and every one of these people here that uh, come together to seek refuge. Uh, let your love be a source of peace, a source of joy and hope for each and every one of us, God. I pray for those of this body that could not be here. There are several out that are sick. And we know that you are a God over all disease, all sickness, all anxiety, all worry. And... Um, as we approach your throne this morning, just help us to be mindful of that. Let the ears of our heart be attentive to what your scripture says uh, and your will for our life. I pray over the leaders of this church, Jeff this morning as he will bring a message, uh, and Danny and the elders and deacons as they lead and make decisions for this body. Heavenly Father, just thankful as we, um, as we worship you, as we lift up your name, all praise to you, everything through your Son. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody today. I wasn't sure what to expect in terms of uh, the crowd. And uh, so you're blessed to have you here. We're glad you could be with us today. We are battling a season of uh, COVID-related things here. There's a lot of folks in various stages, everything from sort of quarantining to be careful on the, all the way up to a hospitalization and everything in between. And so, uh, so we probably have some other folks joining us, additional folks joining us online today. We're glad you could do that. I especially appreciate John stepping in to lead worship today after a day of coaching basketball and yelling at fourth through sixth graders. And uh, he does have a voice left, so that's great. Um, if he hadn't stepped in, we would have been in the unenviable position of, of me actually leading songs, too, which nobody ever wants. So uh, make sure you thank John, especially, for jumping in today. So we've been talking, of course, for quite a while about the kingdom of God. We've been using Matthew's gospel as our roadmap. 
Today is the final message in that series, and uh, we're going to be moving on next week to some Christmas reflections before we then uh, we'll have a week where I'm away. Bill uh, Worrell will be preaching the Sunday after, the Sunday between Christmas and New, New Year, excuse me, and then I will be back uh, with a full slate of 2022 sermons uh, for working on that plan as well. Um, Last week, we, we sort of pondered the end of Matthew's gospel and how he ends with this challenge, how he ends with this charge, what we now know as the Great Commission. It wasn't labeled that way. He didn't say, here I am to give you the Great Commission, but that is how we have come to know it. And the fact is that Jesus has called all of us in the kingdom to this mission. But one of the things that, that we have to deal with is there are a whole host of barriers that, that come up that restrict us, that hinder us, that slow us down things that make it harder for us to accomplish this mission, things that we use sometimes as excuses to not participate in this mission. And so we need to remember that a true, a true disciple of Jesus does not just follow Jesus. A true disciple of Jesus is not just somebody who is being changed by Jesus. They are both of those things. Both of those things are critical. But, but a true disciple of Jesus also, in addition to following Jesus and being changed by Jesus, a true disciple joins Jesus in mission. And so we have to keep coming back to this passage. I did mention at the end of the, the message last week that I wanted, to, I wanted to sort of contemplate, even though we had finished the end of Matthew's text, uh, I wanted to contemplate one more question, one last question, which basically is this. In light of, of everything that we have seen about the kingdom of God over the course of off and on the last year, what sort of kingdom community should we be? What, short, what sort of kingdom community should we be here at the Conestoga Valley Church of Christ? Because Christianity is individual, but it is also communal. It is personal, but it is also collective. And so we have to contemplate that as well, if you have not already been contemplating that, as we've been talking about the kingdom. I have to say, I started pondering this question, it's been a couple of months ago. I was, I don't even remember where I saw it. I think I probably got an email about, uh, an, I get email from a number of places, one of whom is the author Philip Yancey. I like to read Yancey's stuff. He challenges me, uh, stretches me in a lot of good ways. We've done a book club here and there on some of his work, just uh, the way he, he deals with things. Uh, I think he's worth, always worth a read. And in particular, uh, he, he has written recently an autobiography, which I have not read, but periodically he will excerpt his autobiography, and I'll just read stretches of that. And uh, I, I decided after one of those excerpts that, that I couldn't leave this series without us addressing sort of this question. And he wrote about what it was like for him to grow up in a very particular church in a very particular place and time. But he, he said the church he grew up in, even though he has some good memories about it, he described the church he grew up in as being, as a painful term even to contemplate, as being a toxic church. I'm so thankful that I, have not, I don't have that experience. Uh, you know, growing up in a church that had its strengths and weaknesses like any other, but toxic. The, think about what you would have to experience to, to have that experience as, as the church family that you're a part of. And so, you know, he talked about how it was full of good people, God-fearing God people, people attempting to live moral lives, lives of principle uh, based on their understanding of Scripture, and yet how over time... For them, the gospel had really been corrupted. It had been minimized. It had been turned into something else. And he talked, apparently, again in this excerpt, I haven't read the whole book, but he talked about how that has had such a profound impact on him, really for the rest of his life, how he has spent a good portion of his life trying to overcome the toxicity of his church upbringing. Now, let me be very, very clear to those of you joining us online as well as those of you who are joining us here today, I am not suggesting that we are in any way a toxic church. And I, I shudder again at the, at the very terminology. I, I don't uh, take away his right to use it. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty severe charge to level against any church. We are also, of course, not a perfect church. If you've been here for any length of time, you know that. I don't have to tell you that. We're never going to be a, a perfect church unless somehow you know, all of us go and, and we're replaced by perfect people, of which I've never met one. So we're not a perfect church. We're never going to be a perfect church. But as with discipleship in general, the question really becomes, well, are we on that path? You know, being a disciple ultimately is about being on a path, moving toward becoming like Jesus. We're never going to be Jesus. We can't be. But are we moving in that direction? And so fundamentally, that is the question for us as a church. Are we on that path? Are we moving not just individually, but collectively toward 
Christ-likeness? Is that something that we're doing? Are we allowing God to make us aware in this body of our flaws, our weaknesses, our inadequacies, even if we have them collectively, our sins? Are we open to that? Are we seeking God's direction in overcoming those things and becoming more and more Christ-like? In that, that spirit uh, and in light of scripture, I've been pondering some attributes that, that I, I just wanted to, I've been thinking about them, praying about them, uh, th- things that I think would help form any church body into, you know, into a God-honoring kingdom community. And I started out with kind of a long list. It got pared down over time. It got pared down, you know, specifically looking at time constraints. Uh, I don't have an hour and a half to talk to you. And, you know, I think I do believe in the old adage that the brain can only absorb what the rear end can endure. And so I'm not here with a, you know, I, you, I got 25, 30 minutes to talk about this. And so the list kept getting shorter and that's okay. Um, but the first two really have to do with different approaches to the same core problem. And this is how we deal not so much individually, but collectively with sin. And so on the one hand, since, since sin is still a real struggle, even for those of us who are in the kingdom, and I think we would all agree with that, right? Uh, I'm a Christian. I know that sin is wrong. Very rarely do I do something that I, know, that, that I didn't know was wrong. I have a, an awareness of sin, and yet I also have a struggle with sin. There are things in my life that I have mastered by the power of God that are not so much a problem. There are other things I have not mastered. And I, I would imagine all of us would fit in that description, And so, uh, since sin is still a real struggle, even for those of us who are in the kingdom, how do we relate to each other as we all fight this same battle? Because we do. This is part of what it means to be a human being. This goes back to the garden. This is a fundamental part of our human nature. And here, I believe that our kingdom community should be notable for, I'm going to use the term, openness. You probably apply that in a lot of different ways. Here's what I mean. We should be a place where brokenness and sin are not not hidden, but rather that are brought into the light. We should be that kind of place. We should be that kind of community. We should be a place where, yeah, you can come as you are. We're not asking you to fix yourself. I've heard shocking stories of people who have come to church communities with some kind of sin in their life, and they've been told, well, you go fix that sin, and then you come back to us. That... That's appalling. That's terrible. This should be a place where you can come as you are while you wrestle with how God is calling you to something better. While you wrestle with how God is calling you to something greater. This should be a place where you can be frank and open about your sin and your struggles, even as you understand that God wants you to overcome them, not to excuse them. This should be that kind of place. Now, I, I, I have to say openness really only works Uh, in a community when that community puts a high value on humility. We don't live in a world that puts a high value on humility. Uh, And so here again, the church should stand for something different than what we see in culture. I think back to, you know, when Jesus says to his disciples earlier in Matthew, back in chapter 18, he says, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I, that, every once in a while, I forget about that, and I'm reminded uh, several times recently, I've had uh, some of the Bible class teachers come to me, ones who are teaching our, our small children, and say, you'll never believe what this so-and-so said in class today. And it's funny. And by, by the way, your secret is safe with me. Um, but, you know, you should, uh, you should know that, well, you do know, if you've got small children, you know that they are refreshingly, sometimes shockingly honest If you think you have family secrets, but your little kids know them, they are not family secrets anymore. You should know that. You should not be mad at them if they blurt it out, because this is kind of what they do. They haven't learned yet to hide stuff. Unfortunately, they learn that from us, right? Because we as adults, on the other hand, we have learned to cover. We've learned to put a mask on. Sometimes we're like wearing the whole Batman suit. We're just all completely covered in something that, you know, something that... It's, it hides all of our faults and flaws and sins. And i got to say, it takes humility to remove your mask. It takes humility to take off your mask and to say, I know that what I am doing is not what God wants from me, but let me tell you about it anyway. Let me tell you what I am struggling with because I could use some help. That takes humility for us to do that. And on the flip side, on the other end of that, it takes humility for us 
on the receiving end of that, right? It takes humility for us to embrace people who are open with their sins, open with their struggles, recognizing, hopefully, that each of us has our own brokenness, each of us has our own sin in our own lives that we have to deal with as well. This is incredibly important. This is incredibly important. You think about things that matter and how much they matter. I have to say, you can't have repentance without openness. And, and really, you know, repentance is the heart of the gospel. Understanding who we are and what sin is and how it affects us and what God has done to, to fix our sin problem hinges on repentance. And so I have to ask, is this a place where struggling, sinful people who are trying but failing can be open? Are we that kind of kingdom community? On the other hand, you know, there are others who come in contact with our, our little kingdom community who are also struggling with sin. They're struggling with brokenness, but, but they may not really be trying to overcome it, possibly because they don't really realize that it is a problem. They may not even know that God thinks of it as sin. They just may not have that that background, they may not have that understanding. And so these are, these are, again, people, we all have people like this, and we come into contact with people in this church family, people who, who are caught up in sin, who really don't know any better. We forget that sometimes. You know, we expect the whole world to live by the standards of Jesus Christ when a lot of the world doesn't know Jesus. That's partially our fault or our failing. We need to consider that as well. But we need to look at people realistically. We can't expect somebody to be a disciple of Jesus if they really don't know about Jesus, right? And so this is a very real thing. And so for them, this also needs to be. This also needs to be a place where they can connect with God because God is what they need. God is who they need. God is the only one who can solve the problem, whether they know it's a problem or not. But here's the thing. For that to happen, we need to practice, hold on to your hats, inclusiveness. That's a bad word, kind of. Well, it's not, it's not a bad word. It depends on how you use it. Unfortunately, like a lot of things in our culture, this has taken on political overtones. And anything that, you know, that politics gets into the mix is hard to discuss calmly and rationally, right? It, we have trigger words in our culture, and we all have them. I don't care whether you're left, right, or center. Certain words that you just react to. And this may be one. I think it is one in some places. And so I understand. I understand that some words have, or some churches have taken this word, and they have used it to override very clear teaching from the word of God. That happens. Uh, sometimes there are churches that in the, in, the, um, in the pursuit of what they would call inclusiveness, they have in effect said, I know the Bible says, God says that this is a sin, but we're here to tell you it's not a sin. That is not okay. That's also not what I'm talking about today. All right? I would hope you would assume that, but let's not assume. What I think this really boils down to on some level is, is this. Is there anyone who should be unwelcome in this kingdom community? Is there anybody who should walk in the front door here and we would say of them or to them, you know what, maybe you should just kind of turn around and, and head back out the door. There's another church down the road. Or maybe you go straighten some things out and come back and see us later. Is there anybody like that? Now, we do know from history, and unfortunately, even probably in some cases from, from current events, we know that in some churches you might be unwelcome if your skin is the wrong color, if you, speak the, if you don't speak the preferred language, things like that. I, I don't perceive that to be an issue here. I, I certainly hope it's not. If it is, I would like to know about it, because I'm proceeding blindly and naively and thinking that's not a problem. But that does happen. We know that in some churches you may be made to feel un Unwelcome, excuse me, if perhaps you, you don't, quote, unquote, dress appropriately. I love that term. Uh, a term that is so, so concrete that every one of us here would kind of define it differently. And so, you know, I hope that you know. I hope everybody understands that you can come to the church without having to wear, put a suit on or wear a dress, dress fancy. We don't care. I mean, I hope that you know that, that we don't have a dress code, real or implied. There's no unwritten rules of, of apparel here at this church. The preacher doesn't even wear a tie anymore. That's how lax we've gotten with things. Sorry, old joke for people who've been here for a long time. But, you know, there are other types of people that we might be inclined to keep out. I mean, maybe. Maybe we'd want to keep them out. Perhaps people that are involved outside, outside our church, they're involved in causes 
that we would define as being unchristian or maybe even anti-Christian. And so we might be inclined to say to those kinds of people, whoa, you need to, we're not sure that, that we want you here. Or maybe, you know, it's the kind of people that we used to call, I have to try and be, to be more conscious of my age and expressions that you use when you're 55 that younger people look at you funny. But people that, that I might have described in the past as being a little rough around the edges, and maybe in particular, uh, people who come in using vocabulary, using certain words that I might find offensive or appalling, and, and they might want to come into our church, and we might, maybe, they're even, maybe they even got those words like on a t-shirt, and they come in our church, you know, we might be inclined to say to those people, whoa, that's, that's a little too shocking for us. You should maybe, you know, get on down the road. Or maybe, maybe here's the thing, and I want you to hear the sarcasm in this last one. I don't want this to be ambiguous. You know that I'm sarcastic, but... Sometimes that comes through and sometimes it doesn't. Maybe it's people practicing certain kinds of sexual sin. And by that I mean the kinds of sexual sin that make us feel uncomfortable, not the kinds of sexual sins that we are struggling with. Again, get the sarcasm there, right? Because we, we have sexual sins that we think are serious and sexual sins that we're, we've accommodated. Every community... Uh, Every community works to keep out negative influences, right? Every community is conscious of, of danger to their community. And so they're, they're worrying about, well, sh who should we keep out and who should we allow in? What should we tolerate and what should we oppose? And so we have a, a human urge, I think, to do, again, to, to use language from the old Westerns I love to watch. We have a, a human inclination to circle the wagons. It's what they did, you know, in the old movies when the Native Americans were attacking, uh, the wagon train didn't know what to do. You put the wagons in a circle and you have a better defensive position. We kind of want to do that. Maybe, maybe we should say we have, we have an urge to put up a firewall. You know, we want to protect ourselves. We want to protect our children. We want to protect our, our church community. But here's the thing. When we work to keep out people who have sin in their lives, especially people who don't know Jesus, are we really even the church? Are we really even the church? I submit to you that, that when we start putting up barriers like that, we cease to be an actual kingdom community. What we become is something that is not present in the scripture. We become a Christian country club. You know, something that exists to maintain certain rules of order, to keep certain people out and allow certain people in as long as they're with the program and they follow all the rules that we have created to create that separation. We don't want to be a Christian country club. That's not what we're called to. And it's true, yes, God's desire is that every person eventually is changed by Jesus, that every person confronts their sin, that every person ultimately turns from their sin, but we don't start with transformation. <laughs> you don't repent and be baptized and come up out of the water instantly a totally different person. God has done some fundamental things to you and in you that are transformational, but you are not, you have not conquered all of your demons when you become a part of the kingdom of God, we have to work up to this. It's a process. Not only is it a process, but it takes time, even when it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the hard work of sanctification within us. It even takes the Holy Spirit time. That's, how, that's what hard nuts we are to crack. It takes time. When we keep out worldly people, what we do on some level is we take the Great Commission and we turn it into the Great Wall. And that, again, is not who we are called to be. That is not what God wants us to be. That is not what it means to be a kingdom community. Inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. Ultimately, inclusiveness has to be driven by love. Love that emanates from our understanding, hopefully, fundamentally, that God made every one of us, every human being in his image, that God loves every human being unconditionally, despite our sin, despite what we do, and that God wants all of us, every one of us, to be saved from the consequences of our sin. And so to be inclusive, first we got to learn to love. If it's okay with you, I'd like to move on from the topic of sin for a little while, right? We had enough of that for, it's important, but we don't want to dwell there. But here's something else that I've been thinking about a lot. I believe that we should be a kingdom community that, um, and this may seem a little redundant, but a kingdom community that practices participation. 
Now, you know, naturally, sometimes we, we immediately go to the worship assembly when we talk about participation and we talk about the things we do here and being active worshipers versus passive worshipers. I think that's a conversation. It's a worthy conversation, a conversation for another day. What's been more on my mind, I think, is something that, that if you talk to anybody who is involved in church work, anybody, you talk to an elder, a pastor, uh, anybody who's involved in any religious group, Christian group, Jewish group, I don't care. If you talk to people who are involved in faith-based work right now, these days, there is a common struggle that we're all dealing with, and that is that, well, it has more, it has more to do with, it has less to do with that active worship thing. It has more to do with this idea of living life as worship. And that comes from Paul's ideas in Romans chapter 12. And what I think it boils down to is this. For various reasons, some of it is cultural, some of it is generational, some of it is pandemical. I don't know if that's a word, but we made it up. I'd like to see that in word of the year this year, pandemical. Write that one down. Okay. Some of this is cultural. Some of it has to do with generation. Some of it has to do with the pandemics. But regardless, many of us have become spectators in the kingdom. Spectators. That's what we've become. We're we're here to watch. And again, I don't just mean what's going on here, but I mean collectively. Our whole idea about about what a church community, a kingdom community is about, well, I'm here to watch. I'm here to watch while church is done to me. I'm here to watch while church is done for me. We're spectators. Many of us have become consumers in the kingdom. You know, this is, we're shopping around. We're shopping around for, for the best, what we like to call, I, I, I love and I'm appalled by this, by this term. It's not all bad, but it bugs me nevertheless. The best worship experience. As if worship is about me. <laughs> and so we go looking for that or we go looking for the church that, you know, checks all the right boxes uh, for all the ways that we expect it to take care of our needs, which, by the way, are often very specific. Uh, we have had people come and love this church but leave because we didn't have one ministry for a, for a five-year-old with a very specific need, and so they, they moved on. And so sometimes our needs are very specific. Sometimes we have to acknowledge our needs keep changing, and so a church that meets those very specific needs while you have, let's say, while you have uh, high school age children, now your kids move out, and now, now your needs have changed, and so now you expect that church to meet all those needs as well. And so, yes, we become, we become consumers. God never conceived the church to be a passive experience. It was never in the design, never in his intent. What any kingdom community needs is a roster full of participants. And that means men, women, and yes, children who are willing to serve. Who are willing to serve. We serve in a lot of different ways. Serving does not necessarily mean knocking doors and and asking people if they want to have a Bible study. It might mean that. It doesn't necessarily mean that. There's a lot of ways that we can serve. We serve when we work together on some common goal that matters, that contributes to the mission. We serve together when we encourage each other. We serve by looking outside ourselves and our own needs to the needs of others. We're going to spend some sermon time I'm not sure how much yet, but we're going to spend some sermon time in 2022 talking about what it really means to be a part of a church community. What that really means, this is going to come up again. We're going to talk about this again. We're going to talk about this more. We'll have time, I think, to consider some other ideas. Remember, in the meantime, that it wasn't that long ago in this study, Matthew chapter 20, a couple of weeks ago, when we heard Jesus say, whoever desires to become great among you, let him or her become great your servant. When you come right down to it, I think the biggest issue with participation, it's not the only issue, but the biggest issue with it is that without it, it's also pretty hard to get very far with our mission. And I know we just talked about mission last week, and I know you hear about it. I hope you hear about it a lot from Danny, from me, from the elders. It's important. We keep cycling back to it because it matters. We keep cycling back to it because it is central to what it means to be a disciple. And therefore, it is central to be, it is central to what it means for us to be a real kingdom community. Mission. And not just any old mission, but the mission God has given to us. As a body of believers, we have been called to grow in our own faith. 
We've been called to share our own faith. We've been called to, to work with people who are already Christians, but who are at different places on that path of discipleship and to help them grow in their faith. We are not given a quota. Thank God. I had a sales job before I got into ministry. Quotas are killers. God never gives us a quota. And that's because we're all different. And so, yeah, some of us are gifted at this kind of mission. Some of us are driven to do this mission. Some of us will really struggle with it. But all of us have been called to join Jesus in this mission. All of us, without exception. All of us can do something. All of us can participate in a piece of this mission to which God calls us. But ultimately, what must drive that in us is a personal understanding, a personal understanding of the gospel. That's where this is going to come from. Has the gospel, the, the story of the, the life of Christ, uh, God becoming a human being, living, dying, being raised from the dead by the power of God, appearing to many witnesses to prove that it wasn't just an empty tomb, but a live Messiah. That is the essence of the gospel. Has that penetrated your hearts and minds? Has it penetrated our hearts and minds what God has done for us? How much he loves us? how much he wants every one of us and all the people who are not here and all the people who are out there who never even heard of him, how much he wants all of us to be a part of this kingdom. When we don't just know, but when we, when we feel the implications of the gospel, when we feel it deep down, the last thing we're going to want to do is to keep it deep down. It's going to come out of us, and we're going to join Jesus in his mission. Each of, us, each of us has been called. We, we struggle, in, in, especially in America, uh, with our high level of, of individuality. We struggle sometimes, we, even when we take communion together. There are some of us who are thinking very consciously about, about what we're doing as a community, and then there are many of us who are in our little communion silos, like this is just me and God. And so there's room, again, for more conversation on that. But each of us has been called, certainly individually, to become a disciple of Jesus. And I have to say, if you are the only disciple around, you can still be true to your calling. And you can still be secure in the knowledge that even if you're the only one in your orbit, you still have a secure place in God's kingdom. But here's the thing. When people in mutual pursuit of discipleship come together and form a true kingdom community. And now we're talking. And now God can really do something. Now the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we know this. We know that this is what God has always had in mind. We know that this is how God has always planned it. We know that this is how he has created us to function from the very beginning. Even though we're part of the kingdom, we are not a perfect church. We are a flawed church. We are a church that struggles. We are a church that ebbs and flows We've had stages where we have been a bipolar church. I've been here a while. I haven't been here since the beginning. I've seen the good and the bad. I have to say, personally, I'm so thankful for this kingdom community. I'm so thankful for what God has done in us and what he continues to do in us. And I can't wait to see what he has in mind for us next. Let's stand together. Let's sing. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore They're all expecting me and that's one thing I know My Savior pardoned me and now I onward go I know he'll take me through though I am weak and poor And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. 
If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel that hole in this world anymore. Just up in glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel that hole in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel that hole in this world anymore. Please be seated. At this time of year, many in the world think about the love of God coming through the coming through, through the coming of a baby to a virgin. They think of this gift and are thankful for this nice little story. They sing the song, O come let us adore him, and spend a few weeks adoring the Savior of the world. But who really was this baby? Why did God choose a baby? I don't know. Here's where I've come and where I've been. Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 12, says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket and weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Or who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge? or showed him the path of understanding. And then over in Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him, and through him, and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And when I read this passage, I start to get it. Who is it that can understand the ways of God? Who taught him? Who counsels him? Surely not I. I'll admit, I don't know why God or how God did it this way. I don't know why he chose this nice little story to start it all. What I do know is this. It was the right way. This nice little story was done at just the right time. And in just the right way, God's time and God's way. You know, we gather here each week. We remember where this nice little story fits in. It was really a part of a significant part of the good news, the gospel, the story of how a God beyond compare, beyond my measly ounces of wisdom, beyond our comprehension chose to save us from the sins we love to commit. And as we commune together, let's remember that that nice little story about a baby was just the beginning of our God's plan to save us from our sins. Our God, the one who holds the oceans and the universe in his hands, the one who knows all things, the one who is holy and whose glory fills the entire earth, also felt the nails and the sins of you and I. Those sins, those nails, were the only thing that could separate the Father from the Son. And now, that little baby who became a man, who died on the cross with our sins on his back, sits at the right, throne of, at the right hand of God on his throne. And one day, he's going to leave that throne again. And he's going to come back to take us home. And it all started with that nice little story of a baby born to a virgin. Aren't God's ways simply beautiful? When we gather around this table and we think about the whole story of redemption, how can we do anything else but come and adore him? 
We're going to commune now. I don't know why God chose to do communion the way he did, but we know that Jesus, on the night before he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and passed it around. So we're going to take the bread that resembles, that is the emblem of that little baby, of that man, of that body who hung on the cross. So let's pray. Almighty Father, it is a blessing to be your child. I thank you, Father, for your story and plan of redemption that started with it started way before. It started with the beginning of time, Father, but we know that the plan went into motion when you sent Jesus to this earth. And we thank you for his life, and we thank you for his body that took our sins. And as we remember that, let us be grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. And then when he passed the bread, when it was done, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks. He said, this is my blood, remember it. Our sins were on that body. Our sins were washed away and made clean and made pure and made holy by the blood that was shed. So let's remember that now as we pray. Almighty Father, again, I... Th I thank you. I don't know how or why this is how you chose to do it. But Lord, I know, because I know you, Father, that it was the right way. And Lord, I thank you that my sins weren't left on the body, weren't left on the cross, but they were washed away. And Lord, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. And Lord, as we, uh, as we remember the blood that was shed that cleaned us, to give us that hope for his return. May we do so and be grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together as we close in song. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say, he is mighty to say forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Please be seated. Good morning. 
you're a guest here, a special welcome to you. I hope we get a chance to uh, greet, meet you, and say hello this morning. Um, it's good to see all of you. I, like Jeff, was concerned. I didn't know how many we would see here this morning. So uh, it's good to see all of you that did make it here this morning, and a special hello to those watching on the video. So um, just a few things to go over. Uh, when we close here, uh, following this, we'll have a time of fellowship for uh, about 30, 35 minutes. At 10 o'clock, we'll have classes, uh, both for kids and adults. And of course, in this area here, uh, will be a study, Uncommon Sense, uh, Proverbs, taught by John, and uh, across the way directly in classrooms two and three, Jeff will be continuing a study on one another, life and community. And uh, we'll have Spanish language in classroom number one. So and then we do have the kids. So uh, if there's any questions on that, come find one of us, and we'll be happy to uh, get you going in the right direction. But we definitely want to encourage you to stick around, fellowship with us for a little bit, and stay for the classes. Um, the one thing I did have called out on uh, my list of things here was today is the last day to turn in names and uh, food donations for the Christmas basket. So um, make sure you do that today, and uh, that would be a good thing. The pickup for those will be a week from today uh, on the 19th after the second service. I do have one thing uh, before. Uh, I guess i got a couple more I want to do, actually. Um, we did have a couple uh, health concerns pop up, and uh, I'll include those in the prayer. Uh, Carlene Vils uh, had, looks like a stroke at this point. I think she's doing much better now at this point. Looked a little scary there for uh, a little while over the, uh, earlier in the weekend. Uh, Dave Paris is recovering from uh, pneumonia, COVID pneumonia. Is, both of them are in the hospital at this moment. Um, and Fatima's mama, or mother, uh, I think it's Anna Cecilia, uh, is, is struggling. So we need to be praying uh, for all of these. There's a plenty more. Uh, there's been plenty of communications going around. Our prayer list is pretty long. Um, the one challenge I want to make for each and all of us this week is I'd like us all to maybe play the role of prayer warrior. Um, I'd like each of you, I challenge each of you to pick a family or an individual this week and commit to pray for them every single day. I think that God really wants to hear us commit to this type of, of prayer. And just try it this week, each day, one individual or one family. Let's see if it catches on. I'm kind of hoping it'll just kind of bite us like a and hang on, maybe like we've had the bad side of viruses catching on, maybe this can be the good side of picking up some prayer habits and talking to God. Let's see what will happen when we go to him intentionally on an ongoing basis. With that, let's go to him now and uh, close the, uh, the service here this morning. Lord, we're just so thankful we're able to come together. We're so thankful that you're a God who loves us even through some really ugliness that surrounds each, each of us. And we just ask that you help us this week as we go out to be a little less that way and a whole lot more like Jesus. Help us to see that path and give us the strength we need. Help us to be open with our own brokenness. Help us to reach out to others that are struggling with it. And help us to hug them rather than shun them. Just give us that. It really takes courage, like a courageous nature, Lord, that the Holy Spirit can bring in us. We just ask for that this week. Lord, we want to raise the name of Carlene, Dave, and Anna this morning. Special request for healing and strength and comfort that only you can provide, Lord, as they deal with medical issues this morning, health issues. We just ask for healing on each and all of them. Lord, as each of us take up this challenge of praying for someone or a family this week, help us to stay committed to that. Help us to see you and how you can work in others' lives. Help us to see how this is an outreach with us focusing on others, giving, being generous. This season, help us to see the opportunities that 
lay directly in front of us to reach out to others and tell them about you. Guide and direct us as we leave here this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.